Hey, what's up, everyone? And welcome to another episode of We Need to Talk. My guest today is an incredibly talented vocalist, arranger, and music producer. You may not know his name, but chances are you have heard his voice, a voice that has been featured in major motion pictures, television shows, studio albums, video games, live shows, and Disney recordings. He's performed all around the world on renowned stages ranging from Universal Studios to Disneyland Resorts, and he performed with the Golden State Pops Orchestra in Ukraine. Today, we're going to be talking about his personal journey and the intersection of of religion and LGBTQ identity, as well as the new Netflix documentary, Pray Away. Connor Smith, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Of course. So Connor and I have, we indirectly knew each other for quite some time. Yes. <laughs> but we officially met um, a couple of years ago, but I went to Azusa Pacific University with his fiance, Drew, which I'm sure that experience will come up in our conversation. But what I want to talk about today, you know, there's um, a new documentary out on Netflix called Pray Away that was produced by Ryan Murphy. And it's been making its waves around the internet. There's a lot of conversation around it. And the documentary chronicles the ex-gay movement and the rise of a horrible organization called Exodus, whose entire purpose was to turn people that struggled with the quote unquote sin of being gay and turning them straight and trusting, you know, that God and giving your life over to Jesus Jesus would release you from this. Now, those of you that do follow me and you follow me on social media, you listen to this podcast and you know me personally, you know where I stand and you know how I feel in terms of that and what I believe in and what I advocate for. And as someone who has adamantly advocated for the LGBTQ community for as long as I can remember, I can only imagine how troubling and triggering this documentary probably is. But Connor, even before we get to talking about the documentary, I want to start with you and just talking about your personal journey of when you came into your self-identity and what your personal relationship was with the church in the past. Of course. Yeah. So, I mean, I grew up very much in the church. I was one of those kids that found themselves there four or five days a week. Um, my mom was the children's director. Uh, I went to school at church. We had a, a preschool, kindergarten, elementary school situation. Um, and so I, I was very much a, a church kid through and through for the, I mean, really my, my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I think I started to realize that I was different, um, or, you know, nine, 10, 11, but you know, you don't have language for it or you don't know what it means, um, until you're a little bit older. Um, and you know, I, I don't consider myself, you know, I was very fortunate to not be involved in Exodus or in any sort of like, uh, uh, institutional reparative therapy. Um, so I am very fortunate to not be a victim of Exodus or any individual person, but instead I, I do consider myself to be somewhat of a victim of just toxic theology in general around, uh, um, around LGBT issues and around queer acceptance. Um, you know, and that, that has been something that was a massive struggle for me for an incredibly long time. As you were growing older and realizing who you were and how you identified, did you feel that you had anyone that represented what you were feeling? Because I talk about representation a lot. And, you know, for me, for my experience, being a black girl growing up in a predominantly white neighborhood, I was lucky that I did have my mom and that I did have other black people around me to look up to. But I can only imagine that, especially if you're growing up in a really, you know, heavily Christian, you know, pushed environment that you may not have people that you can look to and say, well, I wonder if they're like me. So I'm just curious in terms of representation, yeah. what was that like for you? Uh, no, the very first person I remember seeing that I thought was gay was Adam Lambert on American Idol. And I remember really? having such conflicting feelings about it because I'm like, oh my gosh, I love this person so much. And not only is he like an incredible singer. Yeah. So I identified with like that part of it, yeah. but also like he's a little flamboyant and like, I, you know, I, I, was so like drawn to him, but at the same time had those feelings of like, Oh wait, no, but there's something wrong about this, mm, you know, like, yeah. um, and then the other, the other one was modern family. Um, when that show first came on and there was the gay couple there, I remember like loving their storyline, but also feeling such like deep seated guilt about 
enjoying that storyline because it, I just like really had this inner conflict of like, you're not supposed to be gay. You're not supposed to be gay. We're not accepting this. We're not dealing with this. Yeah. Um, when did you get to the point when you realized this is who I am and I'm, I need just people to accept it and I accept it. It was in college. It was at some point in college, which also was not the best, um, you know, environment to be gay in because you also went to a christian college i did yeah i went to cal baptist university and it you know i had a good experience overall i would say we're looking at macro positives i had a good experience at cbu (laughs) um but it was not exactly the best place to explore you know self-doubt faith doubt sexuality issues identity problems all of all of those things was it was not the best place for me to be dealing with all of that, but I found my way through and it was at some point in college that I came out to myself and I, you know, accepted this part of myself and really started to kind of dive into the theology around the issue and how I could, you know, how it made sense. And then that's when I started finding, you know, Matthew Vines, Kathy Baldock, Julie Rogers, who is in the documentary, um, And then that was the next level of representation for me of seeing like, oh my gosh, there is this whole movement of people that have found peace with themselves. And, you know, the one, the one connection that I do have to Exodus is when I was 16 or 17, I remember, you know, going through at, at one of my low roller coaster moments when it came to my sexuality, finding their website and printing out a, like, uh, um, contract with God or whatever that was like, we're not going to accept our sexuality and we're, we're signing this over to God. And whenever we struggle, we can come back to this paper and see our commitment to the Lord. And, and you know, that, that is the one. And I hid that under my bed because I didn't want my parents to find it, but that's the one, the one connection I have to Exodus. You know, the interesting thing in in hearing so many friends' stories just in their relationship with the church and and coming into their own identity and then, you know, even leaving the church, for example, the one thing that I've never really understood is the reason behind why. Because when you get into deconstruction, you can prove that it doesn't say being gay is wrong in the Bible. Like you literally can prove it. I've heard so many sermons and I'm like, oh, that's completely correct, you know? So when you look at like the basis and like how strong and adamant some of these groups and organizations are, I just want to know why. (laughs) Because, and I don't think that you can ever get an answer from them. And and it's so funny that you hear just even in, you know, conservative um, circles and, you know, in getting into politics, they always talk about how the LGBTQ group has an agenda, but you will never in your life and you never have in your life heard of an organization of LGBTQ people trying to turn people gay. Sure. Yeah. Right. So who actually has the agenda is the question that I want answered. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, it's so bizarre. But so for you in throughout your journey, you know, what was the theology that was taught to you in regards to the LGBTQ community when it comes to Christianity? The theology that was taught to me was very much straight out of the Exodus playbook. Um, you know, it, it was this, if you pray hard, well, twofold, if you pray hard enough, God can change you, but if he's not going to change you, then you have to live a life of celibacy because mm. this is wrong. And, uh, you know, it goes against nature and, and all of those things that they'll say. And they point to the, you know, seven or eight Bible verses that we lovingly refer to as the clopper verses. Yes. Um, <laughs> But yeah, like like you said, deconstruction can, you know, wildly open your mind to what what the Bible says. And I think for me and in, in my own faith journey now, it's still coming to terms with the fact of like all of this, you know, the the twenty six years that I spent in church every Sunday morning, all of that those messages that I learned and the and the lessons that were taught to me are not necessarily true or accurate or, you know, the, the idea that white evangelical Protestants can look at this book and in their westernized viewpoint, even assume that 
what they think about it is right. Or like, if I read this verse without any sort of like historical context or background or knowledge about, you know, the author or, or, or anything like that, that what you glean out of that text is exactly what it means. And yeah. it's just like a little intellectually arrogant and damaging really. It really is. It's very, uh, it's like egocentric Christianity. It's, it's so focused yeah. on what you believe, what makes you comfortable, what you think people should be doing with their lives. And I think at the end of the day, my whole issue is what if you're wrong? You know, you've spent all of this energy trying to tell people how to live, thinking that people's existence really just comes down to procreating, which is not true at all. <laughs> right. Know, there's more right. to life than just having children. And you know what I mean? But like, what if you're wrong and you spent all this time, instead of just loving people, you spent all this time condemning them. And that's what I wish more people would think about because at the end of the day, one, Jesus, you know, advocated for people. He loved them. You know, he hung out with marginalized groups. Why aren't we focusing more on that trajectory of our life and that yeah. walk with God rather than telling people how they are and who they are is wrong? I've never understood the amount of energy that gets put into that and like abortion rights. Those are the only two things that evangelicals care about. For me, it is all about the energy that you are putting out into the world. Are you creating light, joy, and love in your path or are you creating darkness and strife and yeah. pain in the people around you. And another thing that I, I think was wildly eye-opening for me is that a, a huge portion of my life was spent around this idea of the us versus them mentality of Christianity. It's like, here we are in this church building and we are the chosen ones and you know we are right and then there's the world and all of those sinners and all of the gay people and, you know, all of those, those yeah. things. And then w when I came out of the closet, I, and, you know, really started to make friends with people that didn't believe like me or look like me or think like me or live like me, it, it was really eye opening of like, oh, these are the scary people that I've been told my whole life are like evil and like they're actually doing a lot more for their neighbor. They're showing a lot more love in the world than you guys have been in your church pews. So where is the godly representation here in terms of what role we're supposed to play in the world? Yeah. And you know, I think one of the main things in those environments is that you're not taught to have any form of critical thinking. You're not taught to question. You are taught to just believe what is being told to you. So, of course, when you remove yourself from that environment and you go in, out into the real world, you're like, oh, wait, I what? Oh, this isn't that bad. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, there's, this, mm -hmm. um, there's this movie. This is totally a tangent. It's called Everything, Everything. I don't know if you've heard of that movie. I have heard of it, but I've not seen it. It's with Anika Noni Rose and Amanda Sternberg. It totally has nothing to do with Christianity. But the whole point is that this girl has been stuck inside her house for her whole life and has only known what her mother has told her about the world and about her being sick. And she finally escapes and was like, this is not at all what I believe. And I think that's exactly what it is when you leave the church and you start experiencing the world for yourself and you get exposed to other religions, other, you know, other beliefs, just other ways of living. It's really a beautiful thing. And to me, that's what God intended. I think all paths lead to God. That's just always been my belief. And I think that you find your route and your way to get back to God, whether it's him, he, she, it, whatever you believe. Right. But I, I think that diversity in in beliefs and the diversity in the world is what makes, you know, God so incredible. It's like, God, he created all of these people and all of these beliefs. But when you're told that this is one way of living, you don't, you don't know about it <laughs> unless yeah. you leave. Yeah. Sure. So let's talk about this documentary, Pray Away. Yeah. It's been building up for the last couple of weeks. And, and I knew that it would be very triggering for a lot of people. It was triggering for me just being a part of the church and having heard that theology and heard those point of views. I remember um, at Azusa Pacific University, the current president of Exodus came and spoke. And his entire testimony and journey was that he was an ex-transgender, ex-gay person that was delivered yeah. from the quote unquote sin of living that way. He now had a wife and children. And I was sitting there listening 
And I was so confused because one, I had never been exposed to an environment of people that believed that being gay was wrong. I was blessed and privileged and lucky enough to have always been in progressive environments. So oh, imagine what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's so funny when I tell people that they're like, oh God, you had it. It's like my, I mean, my mom, my dad wasn't really a church person, but my mom raised us in the church and she in general was just always this loving, beautiful beacon of to me what Christ's love is supposed to be. And I was always around just a variety of people. So I never was told that like being gay is wrong. That like, so when I got to Azusa Pacific University, I was like, what is the issue? <laughs> you know, like they love this person. What's the problem, right? Sure. And I just remember people being so in awe, like, oh my God, you know, God delivered him from this, you know, this horrible lifestyle, blah, blah, blah. And I just kind of kept my mouth shut at that moment because one, I was like the only black person at that school. And so I really didn't want to like start causing waves. But two, I, w- I didn't even know how to approach that view because it was mm. something I had never been exposed to. So in watching Pray Away, I was, I was taken back immediately to how I felt at Azusa Pacific University. But for you in watching the documentary, was there anything that you resonated with or anything that you were glad was brought up that you were glad people are seeing in terms of this whole community of people that were trying to, they essentially ruined a lot of people's lives because oh, yeah. they were telling them who they were is wrong. You know, there's, there's a couple things. Um, first off, it's, it's one thing to like watch a, an expose documentary on Netflix and it's like about, some other tragedy that you're not like directly connected to, but to watch something that's like, these are like my people and this is what has happened to like my community. It it is very much like an out of body experience. Mm. Um, I think that it is really great that a documentary like this is coming out for people to see because people that did not grow up in the church or that always grew up with um, the understanding that queer people are not evil prostitutes that like are all going to take your children and murder them. I don't know what people believe out there, they but believe like some weird things, something yeah. like that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, they, uh, uh, if you haven't grown up in that kind of theology, you don't understand why people have such an issue with themselves or, you know, we're telling our five, six and seven year olds that they are, at the core of who they are is wrong and dirty and they're going to go to hell yeah. unless, you know, unless they give their life over to someone who they don't understand. And it, it's, it's harmful. I, I think it's harmful. Um, but watching pray away, you know, I, I think, I think that in ways they were a little kind to the people who, participated in this documentary, you know, nine out of 10 of them have since renounced everything that they did. Mm -hmm. Um, and have, you know, admitted that nobody we helped actually changed their sexuality. And I was lying the whole time. Surprise. Um, and I commend them on taking that step and for participating in this documentary. Yeah. But at the same time, like they did so much damage to so many people. So many people committed suicide because of these programs and these conferences. And, you know, I think, I think they got a lot of a, a, a strong pass from a lot for a lot of the damage that they caused. That's a really great point that I didn't even realize until you're saying that it was light on how much they, there wasn't a bigger focus on how much trauma that they caused for a lot of people. And yeah, people committed suicide because of these programs, because you're struggling to just not be who you are. I can't even imagine, like, I can't imagine how that must feel. I really can't. Yeah. But like I said, it was triggering for me to watch. So I can only imagine just like you said, it's probably, it was an out of body experience. What would you have liked them to, to, to like focus on in terms of that? Um, you know, I, well, so like the statistics at the end of the documentary said, like, you know, a s studies found that um, LGBTQ people who have gone through reparative therapy are twice as likely to commit suicide. Yeah. Um, and the, and then uh, I think it was Yvette had said in the documentary that 
if the people didn't commit suicide, they, we were crushing their lives here on earth. Mm -hmm. So like they're still living a half life on this planet. Um, and you know, I, I, like I said, I applaud them coming forward and participating in this. Um, I would have loved to have a little bit more, um, voice given to the victims Ooh, and yeah. you know there there was that one section of the documentary where it had the footage of uh the the people who have come out of exodus confronting the leaders of exodus and saying this is what you did to me this is what i struggle with every day because of what you put me through and that for me was like the highlight of the whole documentary it's like an hour and 20 in though and um i think we could have had a lot more of that. Um, and then also, I mean, I, I understand from a documentary perspective, it's not necessarily the director's job to tell you how to perceive the information being given, right. but the, the inclusion of the freedom March and the like new movement specifically against transgender people, um, I think really didn't have enough of a point of view of saying this is garbage yeah. <laughs> you know um, yeah, for lack of a better word but that's yes. true i was to be honest i was confused by the inclusion of that storyline because it, it, again it is just the modern day version yes. of exodus you know because exodus i think ended in the 90s right yeah that's why they include it because it is still happening and you know exodus may be dead but there are you know other organizations that are popping up in its place and you see right now that that there is a massive onslaught of attacks against transgender people yeah. um and that is the new playbook because the you know lesbians gays and bisexual people have stood up enough to say we're not going anywhere and so now you know now they have to find a new victim and yeah. so that's that's the next fight for us how different do you think your journey would have been had you had early representation of people in the LGBTQ community mm. when you started to feel like, Hey, I think, you know, I'm different. That is such a great question. <laughs> I feel like, um, I certainly would have had a lot uh, a lot more rest as a, as a teenager <laughs> <laughs> and a lot less tears. Um, at the same time, I feel like my struggle and my, um, you know, back and forth with all of my inner turmoil really helped me become an emotionally equipped person um, and an articulate person and in a way I am grateful for the, um, the path that I have been on, but it certainly has not been without its challenges. Yeah, absolutely. I asked that only because, you know, I feel like people are acting as if a lot of these movements and the representation and focus on the LGBTQ community, you know, non-binary um, transgender identities is a new thing. And mm. it's not a new thing. It's just that people finally feel comfortable being who they are. And there is more acceptance now than obviously back in the 70s and the 80s, right? Which is yeah. when Exodus was at its prime. And so I think it's a beautiful thing because you're allowing people to come into their identities early on and realizing that we are a melting pot of people and there mm. isn't one way to live. And I think we will save so many more lives the more representation we allow across the gamut of identities. Sure. And, and, and it, it frustrates me that people don't see that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so harmful. And I think even in watching the, the documentary, one thought I had is that, you know, if you're going through all of this to not be a certain way, you, you are that way, you know? So mm. you're going, they're going through all of this to not be gay, to not be lesbian, to not have these feelings. It's like, you are that then because it, you know what I mean? It shouldn't be this difficult to not yeah. be something. Yeah. And the other thought that I had is, and I, and I hope I word this in, in the correct way so that it doesn't seem offensive, but also when people say that being gay, for example, is a choice, why would you choose to be excommunicated and alienated and ostracized and condemned in this? Like, 
Mm-hmm. That makes no sense to me. That's how, like, yeah. one, to me, that is the obvious that that isn't a choice. No one would choose to be treated that way. That was know? my biggest response that way for the longest time when people would ask me that question. It's like, why would I choose this? And it honestly, it took me the longest time to identify my gayness as a gift and as a strength Mm. and not a hindrance because for the longest time it was this massive burden that I was supposed to carry with me. Um, And it took me a a really long time to accept that God made me this way because it is something that I can bring into the world to spread love, to spread joy and to hopefully combat a lot of the darkness that is out there around people struggling with their identity. Yeah. If you could talk to some of the people from Exodus, what would you say to them? Even, you know, not having been one of their victims, but what is something that you would just want them to know? I think you have to look in the mirror and say to yourself, is what I am doing hurting people or helping people? And this idea that Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted does not mean that when people persecute you for what you're doing, you're doing the right thing. Mm. Just because people are saying what you're doing is wrong doesn't mean that 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 persecution is justification for the pain that you're causing. It could just mean that you're a jerk. (laughs) That's what I think. (laughs) <laughs> I love how civil that is. It's like, it, it just, you're just a jerk. Just, yeah. But, but yeah. like real talk, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in your line of work, how has your identity affected you in any way in that sense? Like when it comes to music and entertainment? Yeah. I, I mean, I lost everything when I came out. I, Man. I was, you know, looking to move to Nashville. I was pursuing a career in Christian music, not so much as like a Christian artist, but songwriter, arranger. I had one arrangement lined up with a Christian publisher and they found out not even after, not even before I had come out, they found out because I had posted something on Facebook in like support of Caitlyn Jenner coming out as transgender. And they were like, nope, we're, we're, we're dropping this and breaking ties with you. Yeah. So then when I like publicly came out, um, well, and, and let me also preface this by saying well, the reason I felt like I had to publicly come out was because I had kept being offered jobs in my final year in college um, to work at, at churches. And then I would always get to the point in the interview where I would say, you know, what is your stance on affirming theology? And I would just feel the room like get all tense and then be like, oh, well, obviously we think that it's wrong. And be like, okay, I don't think I'm going to be the right fit for you. Right. And it just became too exhausting of a conversation to keep <sighs> having again and again and again. Yeah. So I came out very publicly on YouTube in 2017 and I lost everything, mm-hmm. friends, um, relationships, jobs, um, and it was a it was a tough time and for me i really had to kind of like pause take a step back and kind of reevaluate like the trajectory that my life could have and i am so grateful that that happened honestly because it forced me to go after other areas of life that i wanted to excel in mm. and if if I had not lost everything, I don't know if I would be as successful now, you know, if I, if I still had a significant career in church music. That I love that because to me, that was God using you in the way that you needed to be used to say like, hey, this is actually what your path is supposed to be because mm-hmm. you have, you have had an incredible career just in the few years I've known you and seen everything that you've accomplished. That was what your story and your journey was supposed to be. So I'm, I'm glad quote unquote that that yeah. happened to you because you're right. You wouldn't have had these other opportunities had you gone down that path. Yeah. Thank you. That's inc- Oh, of course. Absolutely. So where you are now, in terms of just, you know, your career, your faith, you know, your relationship, what's something that just truly makes you happy on a day-to-day basis? Mm. Um, I think getting 
to use the special gifting that God has given me Mm. for music um, in different ways every day is what brings me joy. I love Um, that answer. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people might be really stressed out by a freelance career. (laughs) I mean, I'm stressed out by it. I love it too, but it's not for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. But I personally love that every day is different for me. And one day it's, I'm, doing a wedding band gig and the next day I'm arranging a choir piece and the next day I'm singing at church and the next day I'm at Disney or, you know, every, everything is different. And that really keeps my soul happy and moving. I love that you're walking in your purpose, which is incredible to do. Yeah. Connor, I'm so glad that we were able to chat and that you were able to be on the show and have this conversation with me. Can you let everybody know where they can follow you on social media and keep up with your great work? Yes. You can follow me on Instagram and on TikTok at Connor Smith Music. And you can find me on Twitter at Connor's Place, although I don't really use Twitter that much. I'm going to be honest. (laughs) Um, And then YouTube is also Connor Smith Music. And if you get a chance, please watch the videos of him and Drew singing together because it will take you into a different mindset and place Aww. all together. It's just, it's unfair, but <laughs> <laughs> that's the only way that I can describe it. It's just unfair, but thank two you. incredibly talented people that I care about very much. So thank you so much, Connor. Make sure you follow him because his voice is unbelievable. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe to We Need to Talk and we'll talk to you again real soon. Bye.